Coming up on Digital Music Trends episode 203 on the 1st of October 2014, a special show dedicated to music product design featuring Hannah Donovan and Rob Hampson. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. Uh, this is a special episode of the show and we're not going to talk about the news of the week but we're going to talk about uh, design. Actually at this uh, moment I'm on holiday for once uh, and uh, this is a special pre-recorded episode that uh, I thought about when I met Hannah uh, a few months ago actually at one of the role events and we started to talk about app design for music and I thought it was a, such a fascinating subject that I wanted to cover it and so uh, without further ado I'd like to uh, introduce my guests uh, for this this week, uh, Hannah Donovan, uh, who is the uh, digital uh, co-founder and design director of This Is My Jam. So hi, Hannah, thanks for joining us. Hello, thanks for having me. It's great to have you. And Rob Hampson, who is the, the digital designer at We Make Awesome Shit. So hi, Rob, and thanks for joining me. How's it going? Hey there, not too bad, thank you. Cheers. And so, uh, you know, I guess we should start with a bit of an intro. So, Hannah, uh, what, is this, what is This Is My Jam? I know my listeners, if, are, if they're usual listeners, they should know this already, but uh, just, uh, just in case they don't. <laughs> Sure, yeah, so a quick intro. This Is My Jam is a way to share your favorite song right now. Not just any song, but the song you really love, the one you've got on repeat constantly, your jam. And in return for sharing this with the community, what you get back is a playlist of all of your friends' favorite songs to listen to. So um, essentially, the network effect of this is that we have only the best music. So we have a very small catalog, but only the best music. It's a little bit like Top 40 reimagined and personalized yeah. for today. That's awesome. And Rob, uh, again, a company that my listeners should know a lot about, but uh, what is uh, We Make Awesome Shit? So We Make Awesome Shit is uh, it's a collective of, of guys that make things. So we make things like websites, apps. Uh, we do things with hardware and art installations, um, mainly around the music industry, although we do kind of branch off into other, other sectors as well. Great. So, yeah. Awesome. And, and we're going to talk about some of your work uh, later on in this episode, so stick around for that. Cool. And uh, I guess I, I divided the show in, uh, in two different sections. Uh, essentially, the first one is going to be a little bit more generic uh, around around uh, the co concepts of, of music uh, music design and what uh, that entails. And the in the second part, we're going to look at some of the examples, both from your own companies and from, from third parties, and have a look at uh, how they've dealt with this specific problem. So, uh, first of all, uh, Hannah, why music design and, and what got you into this field? What are you excited about working in this area? Well, essentially, it's my two passions. Um, I love design, obviously. That's what I do for a living. I've always wanted to be a designer, even from a very young age. And I love music. I'm also a musician. I'm a cellist, actually. And so being able to combine those two things is like, I mean, it's a dream come true. Yeah, <laughs> That's what's led me on this path. That's fantastic. Uh, Rob, for you, uh, what, what led you here? It's actually very similar. Uh, yeah, um, graphic design has been a massive uh, part of my life as well as music. I've been playing drums since the age of seven. Uh, I went to music college uh, in Guildford called the Academy of Contemporary Music. Yeah. Um, and then from there, I kind of managed to fuse the two, which was great. And then I've kind of landed at We Make Awesome Shit, which has kind of fused everything together nicely. Yeah. Okay, so and so talking about sort of your first experience with uh, designing uh, something that had to do with the music or had a music uh, application, uh, what was your first impression in terms of uh, perhaps the difficulties that you encountered on that first project or uh, things that you realized as you started to, to get your hands dirty in the space? Hannah? Sure, well, um, I mean, it's, it's changed a lot. That's the first thing right. I would say is that working in music, and maybe this is the first challenge as a designer, is that it's always changing. It's always in motion. And so you solve one problem and then it changes the next day and you have to resolve it again. But one of the biggest challenges that I remember facing when I first started at Last FM back in 2006 was the challenge around the fact that digital music is only as visual as you, the designer, make it to be. Because when it's reduced down to a file, just an audio file, like an MP3, um, all you have is that audio. But of course, music is so much more than that. It's all of the visual chaos that surrounds it, everything from you know the way tickets look to posters to venues to t-shirts and merchandise and of course album art and all these kinds of things. And so it was quite difficult back, in, back then anyway to really um, pull together together all these pieces to create like a truly emotional experience around music um, from a visual perspective as well as just a listening perspective. And I think that that's 
changed quite a bit now because we have access to much better, you know, image APIs. Also, of course, because it's you know faster to load things these days. You can you can do more, and of course, with this guy, you can do lots of stuff too. But I think it's still on the designer to consciously make those decisions about what the music could look like and how it's really going to represent the audio that it goes along with. And still today, I see music apps that come out regularly that look too much like a spreadsheet. Uh, and so, uh, Rob, for you, what was your first experience in music design and, and how did that come about? Mm, apart from doing, uh, from doing band websites, which is uh, probably how I first started, uh, which um, that's quite a basic kind of example, I guess, oh. doing a website for my own band. But uh, I guess after that, it wasn't until... It wasn't until I first started doing things for We Make Awesome Shit. Um, I'm just trying to think of the very first thing that I did. But, but like Hannah says, it's, it's that way of conveying that kind of emotion that you get with music through a technology medium. Yeah. Um, how, how a designer makes it kind of tangible because it's, it's kind of very disjointed, if you know what I mean, from, from technology to to reaching your ears so yeah. um you know it's how it's how that gap is bridged that's the that's the really tough bit actually yeah um so yeah um i guess in a, in a few of the examples later we'll, we'll maybe maybe see if those were were successful absolutely yeah. so, <laughs> and so uh, you know i i think uh, when you approach a project, I think that, you know, the prep phase is something that people uh, that are listening, you know, that they, they might work with designers on a freelance basis or do, or do different things. Uh, and so what is your approach when you first uh, take on a project? Uh, what kind of research do you do uh, before actually you start working on the practical side side of it, Hannah? Um, sure. Well, I would say the research kind of comes in, in two parts. One is this sort of ongoing research that I'm constantly doing where I'm just always talking to people about what apps are you using? What are you listening to right now? How do you discover music? Um, those types of questions, which just sort of give me a, a background um, bed of research to draw from when, when I need to. And then when I start working on a project, the research is usually much more focused. Right. So it's like, what are, what are we making <laughs> and why are we making it? So those are the two questions that I always start with. That's that's the brief. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then from from those two questions, I choose whatever research method is best to go try and answer them. And and you know some of that might I might pull from this anecdotal research that I'm constantly doing when I'm kind of like talking to people. But a lot of times it might be more focused. I might, for instance, when I started This Is My Jam with Matt, I started it with a bunch of very in-depth, focused user interviews, um, about, probably about an hour long, each one, with a variety of ages and people across different places, stuff like that. Um, but it also might be, you know, looking at certain kinds of statistics or pulling in data from other places. It, it just really depends. I always say, you know, there's no one process that's yeah. always yeah. right. It's about choosing the best tool for the job. And as a designer, the more experienced you get, the more tools you put in your toolkit, and you just pull the right one out when you need it. Absolutely. Uh, and, and uh, you know, Rob, following in, in that direction, uh, how do you, you know, do you guys uh, do everything sort of hand in hand as well? So it's starting with design as soon as the project starts, or, or do, you, do you sort of fall, fall in a little bit later on? I think the design from what we do tends to fall in a bit later on, although we do try and do the tech side and the design side at, at the same time, if possible. Um, but a lot of the stuff we get is is kind of campaign based yes. um, from uh, the music labels. So a lot of the time they might have an idea already or they might ask us to kind of iterate on an idea or come up with an idea. Um, so um, we kind of have to, like Hannah says, we have to use use the pieces that are already there and try and um, try and come to some sort of conclusion about what the, where the project might go or how it might look. Exactly. Um, and also it's interesting to see from, from your perspective that you might get uh, a brief that has already a, where a campaign has a certain look and feel according to the album yeah artist, exactly I mean that, that's another thing is that you know the album artwork normally al already exists yeah. or they might have a website you know the core cool website that already exists so you know things have to look have to look part of the brand uh, part of the artist so yeah that's visually very focused in terms of that stuff yeah absolutely and and uh, talking about uh, just to, f to finish off on the general side of things i wanted to ask you about how external forces sort of uh 
lead you to change the way you design things and how, how sort of annoying or, or not annoying that is in the sense that, for example, something like iOS uh, 7 came out last year and really changed the way uh, things looked and felt on, on, on iOS devices. And so has that uh, been a hindrance? Has it been like a, you know, has it helped in, in creating more innovating designs or, or how do you feel about that kind of imposition? Of iOS was a massive step. Right. Uh, for, well, arguably forward in terms of aesthetic for, for the iPhone. Um, but it changed a lot of things. Um, and, it, and it kind of made it kind of made designers think more in terms of keeping things into the aesthetic of the OS. Um, mm -hmm. So so it kind of it kind of led people into how they might interpret designing the, their next app or the next project which I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing um, so I, I've come across problems before with with a couple of the apps where they just don't fit into that style of the OS mm -hmm. so you kind of have to try and fuse these two things together and and try and make them work um, but yeah I mean I mean I don't know about you Hannah but it changed quite a lot of things for the way that I design or, or the way that yeah. I design visually yeah, me too. Actually, it was um, it was such a relief when iOS seven came out. I was so happy because I felt like finally I can just go back to being a graphic designer again <laughs> because of yeah. this this flattening out of things. And I don't want to talk too much about that because we've all heard enough <laughs> of the flat. But you know, it was just so nice to finally not be caught in this space, which I think we had been for a long time in making interfaces where we. Um, we had to really teach users, you know, what a button was or what a slider was or what some of these controls were. And finally, it felt like we had gotten to this point, this maturity as a culture and as a group of technology users that we could just start using graphics to represent some of these actions again and not have to really go out of our way to, um, you know, shoehorn sort of physical or 3D looking things into an interface, which to me just felt like such a relief because I mean it, it really opens up the door in terms of what you can do with design it means that you can really think um, in in that in that environment in a way that's much more nuanced and much more sensitive to to graphic design than ever before I think mm. that's that's what really interesting to hear because I, I, I that, that's one of the things that I was wondering was like was that seen as almost like an imposition from from Apple to to have to comply to sort of this transparency sort of feel, look and feel of, of the app or of, of this system or, or not. But in, in your case, it wasn't a problem. I, it felt freeing to me. I mean, as Rob says, you know, there's always this delicate balance where how much are you going to make it look and feel like the system that it lives inside so that the user doesn't feel, um, y you know, like confused when they open right. it up. Like, why doesn't this, it has to feel like it's within the system that they're already using. But of course, also, you don't want it to look exactly like the, you know, the iOS or the interface because then the content that you're creating looks no different from sort of the the means by which it's uh, it's delivered to the user and, and that's not great either and that can actually be equally as confusing because then you're not sure what's part of the OS and what's part of the app and it is important that you signpost those two things a little bit differently I think but um, no it felt because the because the UI was so much more stripped back and um, really kind of lets the content shine it's yeah. I think it's great for designers because it means we don't have to do so much sort of like weaving in and out of the the bits that were already there it gives us more of a blank canvas to design from and and mm. the um the sort of the subtlety of the interface can sit on top though I think it's worth mentioning that like it wasn't really Apple that started that I mean right. sure yeah, they yeah. Yeah. You know, they were definitely the ones that said, we're going to go this direction. And that was a huge vote of confidence from them as well, that people would be capable of using these these kinds of interfaces. But I mean, really, it, it was the Windows phone that, that kind of pioneered that thing. Mm -hmm. I remember when I first got iOS 7 on my phone and I was like, this is beautiful. But I was like, damn, like, is my grandmother going to be able to use this? Because it just felt like this power user interface, like everything felt so stripped back. And it was, it was a real shock at first. I, th I really wondered how people would get along with it. But it's amazing that they have and that it's fine, because I think it makes our job easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Rob, so uh, if you're looking at the interaction between what goes on on mobile and what goes on on desktop, and if you are working on a project that requires you to, to develop both sides of, of, of the equation, how, how do the two relate and are there issues in translating what happens in one into the other? 
Well, I guess the biggest thing is, um, you know, the ability to to have touch interface like you would on a on a mobile phone or a smartphone. Um, you know, those those things are obviously different. How you interact with the UI um, and the different kind of actions that you can take. Um, I guess I guess the web has perhaps its own kind of set of rules as so does uh kind of phones and tablets and stuff like that yeah so it's just um it's being aware of those those predefined things and kind of you making the most of them in a way yeah um no that, that yeah. makes perfect sense i mean uh, hannah i guess you, you encountered that uh in your days of last fm as well right the balance mm -hmm. between the app and the and the desktop ecosystem yeah um definitely that was i mean that was one of the biggest one of the bigger challenges there because we were designing for so many different things like uh, our desktop app, you know, was across multiple, um, multiple platforms. And then we had like an iPhone as well as an Android app. It was on Xbox. It was on all these hardware devices. So constantly oh, yeah. we were getting these challenges thrown at us where it was like, how do you represent the brand? And by brand, I mean, not just the logo, but like how it feels, how it speaks to you, you know, what it says when you open it up, those kinds of things. How do you represent that across all these different systems and platforms and UIs and everything yeah. in all these different languages as well, because it's also internationalized in, in 13 different languages. Um, so uh, what we ended up going with, our design principle around that was to always... Um, always ensure that it felt like it fit within the system that we were designing for. So instead of trying to um, sort of throw down our brand on top of something else, we'd take design cues from whatever system we were working within and ensure that it felt like it was really part of the part of the experience. Um, so that meant that that meant that um, because there was a lot more nuance there, it meant that sort of a designer had to look at something every time we were working on a different project because it wasn't just about recreating it. It was about really finding how does this make sense inside this system and sort of sometimes that means changing a typeface or some colors or making the choice to do something different with a logo or with a bit of copy. And yeah. um, that, that requires a little bit more patience and care with each project that you work on. So it takes a little bit longer up front, but I think in, I think in the end it's worth it. Right. Absolutely. And so uh, I wanted to move on to talk about a few of the projects and look at some of your projects and look at some external sources as well uh, to discuss uh, the design, uh, of course. Uh, and uh, that's where, actually, I forgot to mention, if you are listening to the show this week instead of watching it, you're missing out a little bit because uh, uh, you're missing out on the visual element of it. Uh, and you can, of course, uh, go back onto YouTube or download the video version of the show. And a lot, a lot of you uh, listen at the gym or uh, while running. So it's, it's, I, I know it's a little bit more difficult to get the video version of that uh, downloaded but it's certainly worth it in this case and so uh, I guess uh, I wanted to start we can start Rob with uh, by talking about one of your projects uh, so I've uh, put up uh, the screen on there that's uh, the Jaguar skills web game and so okay uh, uh, tell us a little bit about a bit about that and how, how that came out came along so yeah so uh, the Jaguar skills game that was um, a job we got through Ministry of Sound um, and um, the idea behind it was to so it was a kind of multiplayer game where you had to guess which sample you heard of a Jaguar Skills song as quick as you as quick as you can. So it's just a kind of traditional sort of, you know, there's there's games out there that are kind of like that already. Yeah. But the difference with this one was that it was across, it was across kind of all kind of devices. It was completely responsive. We made it for desktop, uh, we made it for mobile, we made it for tablet, um, and you know we had it had to work on on different OSs and everything. Yeah. So that was kind of that was quite a big challenge actually to get something that felt like a game, um, but kind of worked in different um, in different places. Yeah. So yeah, um, that, and the music was, component that of that, uh, how, how do you integrate that? The music, um, I, I would have to ask Sid how he did that. <laughs> I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure yeah. on the on the tech side, but. Um, but yeah, I know that I know that um, that was that was a bit of a challenge to get that to work across different OSs. No, I meant um, also I meant also on a visual standpoint, like how do you oh, sorry, convey the, the visual... fact? How do you convey the fact that this was still sort of like a music-backed app, but it was as part of a game? 
Oh, okay. Um, so obviously, it's got a lot of a lot of the Jaguar skills branding, um, which which uh, I guess I guess the fans of of that artist would be familiar with. Yeah. Um, there's a the kind of lot of musical references within the app um, uh, in terms of illustration and uh, different things like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, just through using brand assets that already existed, we were able to create something that felt oh, it was from the music kind of part of the world if you know what I mean. Yeah sure and are you seeing more sort of gaming things coming along where people want to try and find a, a way to create an interactive experience with the content oh. uh, but yeah. of course on, on uh, the budgets are always restricted and so it, there's always yeah. that trade-off of try to create a game game experience but without having the budgets that you know a big uh, brand would have to do the same thing as a label might want to, want to do. Exactly yeah I mean that is that's one of the biggest challenges is is coming up with ideas that will suit the budgets that labels that labels uh, provide, um, and a lot of the time we we kind of put more time and effort into them than perhaps we might we might have had budget wise, yeah. um, just through sheer passion and love of doing it. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean um, that that's that's uh, that's that's a big thing. Um, trying to get things to look look a certain way yeah yeah absolutely and Hannah so t we're talking about the sort of the gamification of uh, of certain <laughs> things and so let's let's go back and, and look at something like from from way way back and uh, talk about sort of how you incorporated that how sort of last fan played on on the data that it had but it also displayed it visually in a way that made consumers more aware of what the company actually did and how they could use that data in order to, to establish, for example, who listened to most uh, Eric Clapton songs or, you know, what was the real influence in, in your life as far as music was concerned? Sure. Wow. We are really going back here. Um, <laughs> this is like ye oldie. This is what Last FM looked like, um, I guess, when I first when I first started working there in 2006. Right. And yeah, like I was saying earlier, one of the first challenges was to look at how we could bring... Um, how we could make it more emotional, more visual, really make it feel like it was music, yeah. um, as opposed to just all these charts all over the place, because obviously the charts are the bedrock of what Last FM does, but without any kind of um, visual, you know, without without the when, without the something slightly more emotional, you kind of miss out on really what they're trying to say here, I think. Exactly. Um, yeah, I guess this is what this particular screen looks like today. Um, and also, you know, the other thing that we worked on um, is genre agnosticism. So what I mean by that is ensuring that the interface would be um, sensible for any type of music that goes on there right. or that is on there. So it doesn't matter whether you're a metal fan or, you know, really into indie rock or rap or whatever. It felt like it could be a place where you could enjoy yourself and it felt like a place where you could find other music fans. Um, yeah. So that was also that was also a challenge because early on it had a very very you know feel that I think was very specific to sort of London and East London at the time yeah. which which can only get you so far yeah yeah absolutely and, that, and that's sort of a, a challenge that all apps that deal with a larger catalog face uh, yes. as opposed to yeah as opposed yeah, to it's sort projects. of like the exact opposite of what Rob was just talking about, because you've got these sort of, you know, two ends of the spectrum. One is this sort of large service that needs to, you know, encompass all this music and genre and different types of passion and visuals. And then on the other end, you've got something extremely focused where it's just around one band or one record label or one set of set of artists. Yeah, absolutely. And so talking about look and feel for a specific uh, types of, of users Rob uh, you also were involved in this uh, uh, now what's a song project uh, yeah and uh, uh, of course for those that don't know the now brand uh, most of you probably will but it's it's a compilation essentially it's a joint venture between Universal and Sony and it comes out uh, uh, a few times a year, I have lost count now. <laughs> There's so yeah. many, but uh, ever so, like, what was the the brief on that one, and, and you know, how do how do you sort of convey what they were trying to do? So the brief was actually kind of kind of similar to the Jag Skills thing, and it was um, how can we make a kind of music trivia app um, where you you played a song and you just have to guess it out of four options. That's yeah. simply what the game is. Um, but the challenge here actually, actually was from a visual standpoint because the Now brand is incredibly shiny and poppy, and there's gradients flying all over the place. So uh, <laughs> it was how it was how we kind of 
kind of crammed that thing into into iOS, right. and iOS seven came out um, around the same time. So that was that was a huge uh, headache actually, and we went through various iterations of the designs, trying to get this thing to work. We started off really clean and minimal, but it just didn't fit right with the brand at all. So we had to find a way to kind of meet in the middle there, and uh, that's why it looks how it does. It's not it's not my personal taste. Of, of design but you know you've got to you've got to design for the for, for the for the right context right yeah and it's got mm-hmm. to fit the brand and it's got to people have got to recognize it as as part of the brand uh as a whole so yeah i mean that was that was a big that was a big headache yeah. that one <laughs> absolutely and so <laughs> you talked about iteration and that's uh, i wanted to talk a little bit about how you deal with uh, iterating between uh, different types of design uh, in, in the history of a product and uh, Hannah, I know you have a lot of experience in that uh, both on, on the last of M front and on, on the jam front and so uh, and you, you mentioned also the fact that when iOS 7 came out you know you were wondering are users going to take to this how are they going to react to this uh, sort of sudden change and so I want to ask you both sort of how do you feel about uh, changing the UI, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, essentially from a graphical uh, standpoint, uh, so that it looks completely different in order to move the platform forward. Uh, and, and how do you see users reacting to that? Uh, are you worried about it? You know, do you take that into account? Do you try and do more of a gradual shift from one thing into the other so that the users don't feel the pain too much? Uh, how, how, where do you stand on that, Hannah? Yeah, that's a tough one. I think it really depends. You know, I would love to answer every question about design with it's all contextual because it is. It really depends on who your users are and, um, you know, what the scale of the app is because uh, sometimes if you have a very small, savvy group of users, it's not a big deal at all. Whereas with other things, you know, if it's a huge platform and you have a lot of different types of users or people that are less savvy, it can be a problem. Yeah. Um, an example of this that I dealt with very recently, actually, is um, we have been working on a, a gradual update to This Is My Jam right now. We just did our first release of a series of releases a, a, a few weeks ago. Yeah. And with that, we... Um, We made a change to our home screen, which is where people come and play their playlist. And it used to have a a big button at the top of the screen that was very, very unmissable. Yeah, these are the new song screens that we just launched. But the the home screen had this big button at the top that was very unmissable. It said, you know, play all these jams. And we did it like that when we started because we were really trying to ensure that people knew what the product was about and make sure that they knew that, like, on your home screen, that's where you play your your feed of music. Um, but the button had always bothered me. It felt really clunky and it was at the top of the page and it sort of like didn't interact well with the copy that we wanted to put there and some of the other interactive elements. And it just didn't feel necessary from a design perspective. I like to always strip as much back as I can. Yeah. Um, and so we had been talking about removing it for a while because, you know, the, the obvious thing is to just have a play button on the very first item in the list instead of a big button on top, which is what I wanted to move to. And so finally, I, I convinced my co-founder, I'm like, I think we should just, let's just make this change and see how it goes. We'll watch the stats. If it, if it dips, if it looks really bad, we'll put it back. But yeah. let's just give this a shot. And, um, and so we did. We took it off. And only one person emailed us about where's the button. Everyone else nice. seemed to just <laughs> Wow, so, that's good. <laughs> Phew, that's fine. Um, so you can, sometimes you can just do things like that and, and people figure it out right away. Other times it's um, it's not as smooth as that. I definitely have had experiences, especially at Last FM, where we would change an interface element like that. And, you know, the next day I would just have an inbox full of angry people screaming at me. <laughs> wow. um, so it depends. I think it really depends. <laughs> it's, it's, always, it's always a tough call. But Whatever you do, you just need to um, you need to do your research, and then you need to make a decision, stand by it, and then just watch your stats. And if you make a mistake, change it. Yeah, mm. yeah. And Robert, on that, like, of course, you do a lot of projects that come out and and don't perhaps evolve as much uh, during yeah, the course yeah. of the pro- life cycle. But have you encountered projects where you you re- release something and perhaps something wasn't really working the way you wanted it, and you had to change some elements uh, of the design uh, uh, to to make it work the way you wanted it to? Yeah, certain, uh, there's certainly cases where you think that you've you've got everything nailed down and you've tested it and and you come to launch it and and kind of a uh, you know a few weeks in it you you look at the stats or you get feedback from people and you realize that actually 
it's not working quite the way you expected it to or right. uh, e- even with user testing once you get it out there to the masses suddenly suddenly you might realize that something isn't quite right so um i guess you know we w- we would change we would change that thing and 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 uh and then get it uploaded cuz it's it's ju- it's just good to get those things ironed out and 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 changed as soon as possible i think and and i guess as as uh as things progress like a year later, something something else might happen, and you might need to change it. But I, th- I think I think people expect change, especially with with digital products uh, and websites. You know, they're quite used to things layouts changing or things being tweaked. So I, I don't think I think on the whole that's okay. I guess it, when it comes down to kind of core functionality, that's when you kind of have to be quite careful. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess Hannah will, Hannah will know a lot more about that than than I would. So, yeah. And, and so uh, Hannah, uh, on on the you talked about the fact that of course uh, when we in the last few years we've we have ma- massive access to bandwidth. You know, it's all become a lot more visual. Uh, thing images are bigger, are sharper, higher definition. So, how has the access to those images involved when you're looking at higher, uh, you know? Uh, you know, a wide products that are going to cover you know thousands or have hundreds of thousands of tracks, and and is the availability of those of those assets become uh, better through APIs over the years? So where are the resources that you can find that kind of that kind of uh, stuff? Yeah, I mean that's a good question. Uh, it's still a lot of that stuff still operates in very much of a gray area from a, a licensing perspective, I would say. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know. Yeah, I mean, the, the image APIs that exist are, are good ones, and also I think that there's just a little bit more, um, a little more understanding for users uploading their own content or imagery associated with something that they love that, that, that seems to be something that's a little bit more acceptable now than, than it was, say, back in 2006. But, you know, again, it's, it's always changing, but ultimately I would say that we're in a much better place today than we were then and I hope that in the future we're in an even better place. Yeah, exactly. And I just wanted to to, to point to the the newest uh, uh, Wonder.fm site that launched uh, uh, yesterday, I think, or the day before. Uh, it's the new Stephen Phillips project uh, after We Are Hunted, which actually looks remarkably like We Are Hunted in a sense. Uh, it's a, it's a very similar uh, idea, and the idea, of course, is that everything is pretty li- linear it's just the artwork and the ability to play the song from soundcloud and it sort of gives you a, a way to navigate through that in a, in a fairly s- striking uh, easy to 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 see uh, manner and uh, uh, but on that front i'm sort of I'm, i was wondering how do you feel about uh, certain platforms like SoundCloud, for example, uh, this is all taken from SoundCloud, but it looks so remarkably different from what SoundCloud looks like. Uh, and in, in a sense, if you go to SoundCloud.com and try to find music, it's it sort of still looks a little bit clunky when you compare it to something like this, and you wonder if they've gone as linear as as, as they could have uh, till now, or or sort of what what the kind of constraints they're working uh, against that don't allow them to go uh, so clean and and so so linear. I don't know if anybody's got anything on that. <laughs> mm. I, I, I guess quite often there's kind of constraints that that perhaps we wouldn't realise from the outside. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. So yeah, maybe, I mean maybe there's a few internal things there or or other bits and bobs. I'm, I'm sure they must be iterating and trying different ways to kind of simplify things and you know. Yeah, because I mean, it, it, the interesting thing is, it's become such a, a much better interface than it was maybe uh, you know a year or two ago. But uh, on the browsing front, it's, it's still. You know, we've seen the app, and the app is sort of probably the future of, of where it's going to go. But it's kind of interesting to see a third party come in and integrate the API mm. and bring up this stuff in a, such a cleaner, radical way, yeah, radical yeah. way than than how it is on the main page. But uh, it's and that's how it goes. You know, like when you have, and I think it's so important not to. I always hold back from giving any criticism without understanding course, yeah. the the, con- mm. the context around it because. Yeah. Well, first of all, those are just good rules of critique. Like you need to know the thinking behind it, and how long did that designer have, and you know what were yeah. they dealing with? Were they doing it at two in the morning? Did they have three months? Like I don't know, right? I'm not going to say anything until I know all those exactly, things. But yeah. what I can be sure of is that you know SoundCloud is a is a pretty grown up product now, which means yeah. they must have a ton of legacy code and legacy mm-hmm. stuff kicking around. And, you know, the more of that that you have, kind of like the more baggage you have to carry around with you. And it means it becomes harder and harder to break 
certain flows that perhaps power users use or certain corner cases need, need to be there for some reason because that's integral to your product. Yeah. Um, I certainly dealt with a lot of those challenges at Last FM, and the more you grow, the harder it is to be really nimble. Yeah. And so, you know, it looks, Wonder FM looks beautiful, but it's also kind of unfair to say that because exactly, they've got yeah. a, a clean slate, right? They just like plug yeah. in the API and they can do whatever they want, which is is so much different when you're dealing with something that has a legacy. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's why you know, I wasn't intending it as a critique. It's just as trying to figure <laughs> out, uh, like trying to explain perhaps why why these certain things work in different ways. In but, different you know, context. that's also why that's also why it's so great that we yeah. have um, the, the APIs that we do and that we all yeah. work together and the industry is so small and we all learn from each other and you know it's so amazing that we can all kind of access each other's stuff in a way and play around with it and kind of mm -hmm. have these little sandboxes because I remember many times where people would integrate things with the last FM API where I was like this is a great idea like we should we should do this you know we should integrate this into the core product and um, maybe that's a thought they're having right now when they're looking at that site or not and i think you know the really important thing is to remember that we all we all work with each other's material we all kind of um share it in a way and we can share ideas with each other that way too absolutely absolutely no that's, that's something that i guess uh, uh is it's so important to remember because uh, these services are, you know, sprawling at this point. You know, it's it's so difficult to change things uh, uh, in a way that is consistent throughout the service. And we've seen that, you know, f there are a bunch of different sites that try to do a sort of an alpha and a beta version, and then we've seen how long the beta version stayed beta because it was just really hard to implement it across the entire site. And uh, uh, so, talking about, uh, so I wanted to move on to talk about something uh, Rob that you did as well. And uh, so that's a tiny Tempa app, and that's an interesting uh, uh, sort of merging of, of design video and yeah. audio in, in, a, in a completely uh, unique way and so uh, w w where did you come in on this because of course the concept dictated a lot of what was going to happen in the app but uh, yeah. how did you make sure that this worked the way it did and actually made the impact that it did so the coolest thing about this project is we had really good communications between between us, the label, and also uh, the artist, um, which was great. We had access to the artist. We were allowed to suggest things like uh, how the video should be shot um, and various different intro bits. So our idea was the video should be... I mean, the video is the core content, right? right. So that should dictate and help people navigate throughout the app itself. So at the beginning of the app, Tiny Temple will introduce, introduce the app and say, you know, this is what you do, this is what you, can, what you can do, and this is how you share stuff, et cetera, et cetera. So we kind of really wanted to strip back completely any, any kind of buttons as much as possible and let the video dictate the navigation, which was a really, really fun way to do things, actually. Um, and, and to be able to have access to the artist and to to get things videoed exactly how we wanted it to be done and so it, it also probably gave you a, an interesting view with all the youtube videos of the users shot with the app of of how how it spread and how people are using it and, and sort of uh, making yeah sense that of was it cool it, that's the uh, that was the other thing is you kind of you kind of making a tool for people to be creative with, yeah. which is which was great fun. So you you kind of see, we could see different ways that people would use it, which is you know that was that was really cool to see people being creative with it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. And H Hannah, uh, talking about the uh, database that you guys have put together, this is my jam. So how do you go about uh, uh, sort of organizing this the song pages and uh, the artist pages and how things were going to work within that? Was it a, was it a long process for you guys? Um, it was, a, it was a bit of a long process. Yeah. I mean, probably my co-founder Matthew would be able to better speak to the, you know, the data side of things. But yeah. what I can say is it took us about, um, well, I mean, we've been collecting the people's favorite songs for a while before we were able to light up this song graph. Cause it just, we needed a certain amount of jams to get it to the point that we could do it. So yeah. it's about 2 million jams posted. And then when we do the deduplication on it, um, to a degree, though, you know, that's a whole other conversation in itself, how you do that. Um, it's about, um, I think, one and a half or something. So we, we, we wanted to make these song screens very... Um, 
just very uh, sort of singular in their intent around songs and not get too sort of tied up in how you link it out to artists or anything else. And we, we don't, we didn't want to deal with the album layer at all because that's not what we do. Yeah. Um, and we also feel that songs are underserved online today and we wanted to focus it really around songs and um, because that's, that's how people listen today. They, they don't listen to albums anymore. Yeah. Really. Um, <laughs> Uh, I said it. Um, so, so yeah, so, I mean, it was just, it was, it was actually really, really simple, you know, it's, it's a song and then it's the name, the name of the song. And we, we also make sure that we have a few different versions so that, um, if it was, uh, for instance, like a live recording that an artist did of that song on a very specific show or something, and like, that's something that someone Posted as their jam. Yeah. Um, that's a different uh, piece of. Uh, that's a different screen than say like the audio recording that's on um, SoundCloud or something like that because those are two actually those are two different experiences and you might love them for different reasons. You know, people post something as their jam because they love, I don't know, the sparkly gold jumpsuit that person is wearing in the video or whatever. And like, that's, that's, that's different and meaningful and important to have the context there because yeah. that's, that's the kind mm -hmm. of stuff I was talking about at the beginning of this, about the visuals around music and the, the context and richness and all that sort of emotional connection. So it's really flat, you know, we just have these, uh, we just have these songs. And then once we, we did it, we were, we're like well it will be pretty easy to create these these artist screens from it so we just stubbed in those artist screens which are really just um they're like the you know like not even one yet <laughs> it's like 0.5 yeah. <laughs> um but we have a lot more plans for what we're gonna what we're gonna do with those um yeah coming soon yeah that's great and and um, the social interaction aspect of it is, is also something that is uh, pretty tricky i guess to implement because uh, some apps uh, you know allow you to do things within the app uh, uh, like tweeting or uh, you know uh, even emailing at times and, and some apps uh, take you outside the same happens on a desktop device some 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 uh, sites allow you to tweet directly from the site and some bring you uh, out into the into the twitter interface and so how do you sort of deal with those uh, constraints of how the, the app is built and how you try and do that, that kind of stuff uh, and uh, does that affect users and the way they, they also react uh, or decide to share or not to share things depending on how that implementation is, is, is uh, carried out? Is that a question for me? Uh, either, yeah. either or both. <laughs> um, well, I think it it's, uh, goes back to what Rob was saying at the beginning of this podcast about just following the best design patterns for whatever right. platform you're on. I mean, there's a lot of expectations around what happens when you hit a Twitter button on the web versus when you tap it on your phone. And um, it's just important, I think, to choose the pattern that people are most likely to recognize. Yeah. Rob, I guess you're... Well, okay the cool... I, I th the, isn't, isn't this right, Hannah? With this, is, this is my jam that you can si you sign in with Twitter or Facebook, right? Yeah. So, I mean, already there, you, you don't have to then have the pop-up thing with, uh, you know, t you, the thing that you can tweet and all that stuff. Is that right? Um, on the website, we, well, we take you, we have the, we have the pop-up up here so that you know that you're about oh, okay. to like, Sorry. sit right, okay. Twitter. I, I yeah. thought I was kind of streamlined, but I mean, I've been using this as my jam for ages and I've never even considered the fact that that was an annoyance. So, I right. mean, oh, I see that, what I you mean, mean. Yeah. when, when you post the jam, it is streamlined. Yes, it is yes. built in there. Yeah. When you post it so that it's like, it just goes out to Twitter and Facebook silently at the same time when you post yeah, your jam. I mean, that's great. Right. So once, yeah. once you've got past that initial barrier, then it's kind of like, it's really easy just to do the to do the rest of the stuff so i mean yeah, i think yeah, that's great yeah sorry i thought you meant like the the, the buttons on the other screens no, 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 were, sorry no. <laughs> yeah it is though it's it's always a tricky one you know there's so much hate for signing in with facebook and twitter from some people right, like that's, that's probably yeah, been yeah. the majority of the user feedback email i've had to deal with and i mean the best way of doing it is you know only ask i think asking for permissions incrementally so like connect your account but then don't ask for permission permission to post until you're ready to do that action so that it's very explicit as in when you're doing it. But, um, you know, that adds like, I, I think sometimes people are not sensitive enough to how much development time that kind of thing takes and how when these services change, how authentication works, then you're on the receiving end of that. And um, yeah, it can be 
it's a, it's a really tricky balance in terms of how do you, you're, you're trying to do the best thing for the user and make it as smooth as possible. But then at the same time, sometimes people really don't like you for trying to do yeah. that or they don't like you until they realize that you're kind of like a nice person and, and not evil, I guess. Right. <laughs> until right. I email them back personally and I say, chill out, we're, we're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I wanted to sort of give a give a um, ask you guys for a bit of advice uh, for people that are into design or are designers. But I, I've met a few people that have uh, design degrees and were like, "Oh, I can't find a job. There's, there's not that much that many jobs for designers." And I'm like, "Well, I'm sure there's like a ton of jobs for designers that want to do things." Uh, on the web or you know uh, on, from a from a tech perspective there's actually quite a lot of work going around so they're like oh well actually i don't like to code or i don't want to code or i haven't learned to code and there's always that concern from people that are working in this field of how much they need to know and and uh, sort of what the basics are so can you tell us maybe elaborate a little bit, a little bit uh, rob uh, and hannah about uh, how much do you need to know to get into the space that as a designer that wants to work in tech and what perhaps are other things that you should be looking at first uh, when you're moving into the space I, I don't think you need to know very much at all, actually. Like, initially, you can you can be playing with things and you can write code kind of straight off the bat, especially when it's just HTML and CSS. Yeah. You know, it's so e so easy to get into that space. I guess I guess the initial barrier is quite scary initially to be writing code and to learn the initial kind of um, way things are structured and stuff like that. But yeah. I mean, once once you're over that little little step, then you know, it's it's kind of it's pretty, pretty, pretty uh, plain sailing from there. I think out to a certain point. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean that's good to hear because I think a lot of people, yeah. like, as you said, is, if they find it scary to just get started on that, if they have a skill in design and they're like, well, how do I, how do I get in? Things are always scarier when you don't know what they are. Yeah, yeah. As soon as you, you know, shine a flashlight into that dark corner or whatever, and 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 actually look at what the thing is that you're afraid of, it's usually not as scary anymore. So, you know, the easiest way to get over that fear, or that barrier, if I'm talking to someone who has that concern, is just like, start coding, like start trying, start breaking stuff, start messing some things up, you know, start with looking at what other people have done and, and try breaking that and putting it back together. I mean, mm. I think... For me, as a designer, it was just it was really, really obvious that 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 was the way to go because um, coming out of a very traditional graphic design background, we you know there was always this producer in the, in in between this middleman in between my work and getting it out to an audience. And when I you know I, I took to computers because I was like, well, this is great. You can get rid of that middleman. You don't need to have someone print it or manufacture it or fabricate it or do any of those things. You can just like write the code and it'll it'll just appear there on the internet that's amazing and i mean now it's sort of like we're we're going back to those challenges again i think because as a lot of us people who grew you know grew up or made the first part of our careers like rob and i you know making websites and apps and stuff like that as we move into objects and physical things and wearables and all this other stuff that's happening in the moment you know that fabricator or that production person is in the middle again so we're going to have to kind of like relearn or or you know kind of um rest on some of our skills and, and knowledge from from doing things you know almost the, the old way so to speak as we <laughs> yeah. as we as as the industry transforms yet again but that's that's the amazing thing about the industry it's always changing i would just say don't be afraid dive in and you'll see it's actually really easy and, and there's always ways to design things without having to code them. I know code, learning code is incredibly important, but if you if you want to kind of go before that step, before the step of learning code, then you can just be you can just design something in Photoshop, you know, and play around with how UIs work and how usability works. And then and then the great thing about the web is you can upload it somewhere and see what, get comments from people and you know get reactions. Yeah. So I think that, I think that's really cool that that the internet enables us to do that and to get feedback kind of instantaneously. Totally. And there's always hacks you can use too. Like now, you yeah. know, if you want yeah. prototype animations or something like yeah. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. even have to be that complex. Like often I'll just like shove little bits of paper around on the table and make a video of it with one, one of these and be like, do I like how that feels? You know, like it can mm -hmm. be, it can be the most like bare bones, basic, Thing ever mm. using the simplest tools like a piece of paper and a pencil but it's just about I think most importantly um, just understanding the limitations of the technology and the limitations of what the code is capable of that's probably the most important thing for a designer to be able to do because I don't think that anyone will ever expect you to be like an amazing 
programmer and, and nor should they because you're supposed to be an amazing designer that has a good enough understanding of technology so that you can do your job well. That's awesome. It's great to hear. And I think it's, uh, it's a good note to actually uh, end on. Uh, I, you know, I hope that this wasn't uh, uh, too uh, <laughs> sort of insulting for you guys in the sense that uh, I asked very generic and basic questions, but I think, I hope... <laughs> no, no, I think it's great. I, no, I, I really hope that like this kind of reflects uh, the audience as well, because a lot of people have, uh, unless they've worked uh, as sort of managers for companies or worked in certain roles where they have had to, to deal directly with designers, they, they still see it as a little bit of a dark art, and uh, uh, um, certainly I did in, in that sense. And, uh, <laughs> and so it's great to hear sort of a little bit more about how that world works. And... Uh, I guess I'd like to close by asking you how uh, the real world and real fashion and real trends are influencing what, what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And then we can probably call it today uh, uh, as, as sort of a last uh, uh, closing question. Uh, uh, Rob, uh, <laughs> how, how, is, uh, how is culture uh, affecting your how work on a day-to-day -day basis? Blimey. Uh, well, that's, that's quite a big question there. Um, <laughs> yeah, just, to the know, just to leave you on a, on a, on a <laughs> difficult note. Something I've started doing actually every day I'm I'm making something small and I'm doodling or I'm you know I'm doing little bits and bobs and I'm t taking things I see from the world around me and I'm trying to interpret those in in some kind of pen drawing. So I guess that that is how the world around me is influencing me at the moment. I'm seeing lots of I'm going out there and looking for lots of different things and trying to interpret them on the page somehow and that's my way of staying creative and staying uh and you know keeping keeping fresh I guess. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I've been loving it, by the way. The little the drawings you've been putting on Twitter have been so cool. Yeah. I love them. You should go Thank check you. out the... Was it, was it a pineapple fish that you did the other day? Yeah, I, uh, I tried to oh. imagine how a fruit would look if it was underwater. It was yeah. amazing. I loved it. I loved it. Um, yeah, I mean, same thing here. Like, I just... I think culture, the pop culture, it's completely intertwined with music right? right so if you are going to be a designer working in this space it is integral that you care about that stuff and that you love it and that you want to be out in it and you're going to explore it and you know that's one of the reasons why um you know i love living in london it's because there's so many gigs here there's so many the people watching is amazing you see all these different styles and fashions on the street which i always take note of and i'm I sort of, yeah, like just collect all this stuff together, kind of like I, I just sort of soak it up like a sponge, you know, that's what inspires me for the next project that I work on. And yeah. also how I express myself too, because I think it's a virtuous, virtuous cycle. So I get really interested in a particular aesthetic and then I sort of bring that into myself and I express it out of the world in terms of how I dress or the projects that I create or um, the doodles that I do or what or whatever it might be until I feel like I really tapped that particular visual interest that I'm really into. At the moment, it's patterns on patterns. You can tell, cool. right? Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's awesome. And, you know, once again, I, I don't know how to thank you. It was been such a pleasure having you both on and uh, uh, telling me a little bit more about how uh, this world works. And I think I should leave you with uh, uh, this uh, beautiful drawing by Rob uh, on uh, the pineapple fish. <laughs> that I just pulled up in about two seconds. I love that. <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, so thank you so much for joining me, Hannah and Rob. Uh, remember to check out uh, uh, um, thisismyjam.com. Um, that's right. The URL, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. this is Majab.com. Perfect. Uh, I tend to get those wrong. And uh, uh, Hannah's uh, uh, Twitter handle is at Han if you are listening to this and not watching it. And uh, Rob, uh, for Rob, it's uh, uh, robhampson.co.uk. Uh, and we may call some shit. Uh, well, we may call some shit.it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the handle is at Rob Hampson on Twitter. Uh, thanks so much for, for uh, coming on. No worries. Thank you. This is and, great. Uh, and thanks for join, for listening to the Digital Music Trends show. It's a design special, not a news show, as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast. Uh, next week, there isn't going to be a show, and we'll resume uh, the week after, which is the week of the 12th. So you should expect a podcast around the 16th to 17th of October. Thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week. And until uh, next time.